All right, guys, congrats on completing part one. By now, you're starting to feel more comfortable navigating Pro Tools. And we're about to jump into part two, which is all about taking our recordings to the next level with vocal production. This is the reason people hire me again and again. It's all about the way I treat my vocal recordings to get that pop professional sound. If you use these techniques, this will separate you from your competition in the work for hire marketplaces, in the acapella licensing marketplaces, sample pack marketplaces. The right vocal production will put you on top. And I've met some seriously mediocre singers who are killing the game because their production is that on point. You can be an incredible singer, but without tuning or mixing, you're not at industry standard. Really start to think about it like this. You are not selling your voice. You are selling your recordings. Even if your only goal is to push your artist career, you want to get your recordings for your album to sound phenomenal. And when you go on tour, that's just a different type of experience for your fans. That's the raw you. That's the raw talent. But when people are playing your song on a Spotify playlist side by side with other artists, they will think something is low quality or even low talent if they hear a non-vocal produced song next to a vocal produced song. The untrained ear can spot it. They might not even know why something feels low quality. They just know. So in the next few modules, I'm going to show you exactly how to get your vocals playlist worthy. And let's prove it to ourselves. Let's A-B test your current recording that you should have today if you did your homework. We're going to get started with some performance aspects of vocal production. This is very different from voice lessons because this is specifically vocal techniques you use when you're approaching the mic for recording. And that will set you up for better editing. Technique period is all about setting yourself up to not have to do as much in the next phase. Performance technique makes for better editing. Better editing makes for better mixing. Just a quick note on that. In the future, when you're ready to upgrade your equipment, the first thing you should focus on is a better mic. A better mic will record the cleanest, most natural sound so you don't have to do much work in the mixing phase. During mixing, things like EQ are going to help correct the sound. And a great mic will produce an already great sound. As you'll see, my EQ settings are super simple because my mic is already doing most of the work. The second most important piece of gear to upgrade down the line when you're ready would be your interface. The Apollo Twin or the Apogee Duet are both really great mid-level priced interfaces. I recently upgraded from the Apollo Twin to the Apogee Symphony, and that in combination with my Manly microphone is such a great sound. I still to this day have never purchased a separate preamp, but a lot of singers do. A preamp is a second piece of hardware that pairs with your interface to improve the sound from your mic before it hits the interface and then enters your DAW. Our interfaces have built-in preamps, which are basically the gain knob. And honestly, they tend to do a decent job at the mid-level. So just keep those things in mind. So let's jump into my personal secrets for the performance aspect. This is a culmination of 12 years of collaborating with other incredible vocal producers like Louis Bell, Rodney Jerkins, Taz Jackson, August Rigo, and many more, as well as working with tons of clients who have hired me to record songs in various genres, various tones and styles. I've been challenged to sing in new ways I've never tried before, and I've put everything I've learned in that booth into these lessons I'm about to share. The editing comes after that, and that is really the biggest piece to making a massive difference in your recordings. Editing, tuning, and time aligning are the golden ticket. Mixing is the next phase, and such a big part of my personal mixing process is already done before I've even started. I'm talking about the template. We already went over the template a bunch, but it's so important that you understand that stuff even if you're just going to end up using mine, because we have very different voices and your mix won't be exactly the same as mine. You will be making changes to your template over time. And eventually, when you're recording a new song, you might literally make zero changes to the mix and send it off. That's how powerful having a great template is. I have one big secret you might want to use. It takes time for our ears to become conditioned, to know exactly what to do to make a mix perfect. Keep practicing, keep fine tuning your mixes, but I've got a hack for you if you want to skip light years ahead. You've already skipped light years ahead by using my template, but one thing you can do is record a song, get as close to perfect as you can, then hire a super dope mixing engineer to do the final mix for you. When hiring them, make sure they agree to send you their Pro Tools session when they're done so you can see what their settings are. Some engineers won't agree to that and that's okay. Just don't hire them. From there, you can use their seasoned professional mix as your new mix 
template. I just hired William Bowser, seven-time billboard charting mixing engineer, who is one of our guest speakers. He just audited my template for me and gave me a bunch of smart changes to my mix that now I continue to use over and over. His changes are in the new template I gave you. Lastly, I just wanted to let you know about the special effects module. It's packed with insane extra details you can add to a song or consider using when making cool vocal drops or sample packs. When you've gone through all of that, I'm going to take you into the booth one last time in real time to record a song from scratch to finish. This song is super special to me. I wrote it with my favorite composer, Ara Mondosian. It's video game style trailer music, which has to be the most eclectic style possible so you can see all of these vocal production techniques live in action. All right, get ready, because it's time to pour on some vocal sauce. All right, so the performance. This is all about laying a great foundation for your editing to make your editing easier. Starting with mic height, you always want your mouth and the diaphragm of the microphone to be lining up. The diaphragm in a condenser mic, you can see it as like a circle piece that's in the middle of the mic. You can usually see it through the mesh. One error I see a lot is people will set the mic height based on how someone is just naturally standing. But once we actually start singing, we tend to posture up. And sometimes our chin lifts a little bit. So often you'll have to raise the mic a little higher than you think you should. I sing like this, so I'm basically shooting my voice right into the diaphragm. Second is how close you are to the mic. You want to be about six inches away. I always just use my pinky and thumb. And I'm, I'm measuring from the actual mic, not the pop filter. So because then I'll be like very far away. But it probably comes out to be like this far from the pop filter. That's fine. If you're super duper close to the mic, uh, and maybe you can hear it in my audio right now, when you get closer to the mic, uh, what happens is this thing called proximity effect, and it amplifies the lower frequencies of your voice. When you're standing a little bit further away, it's just going to be an accurate, even amount of all your frequencies. Also, when you're a little closer to the mic, it can pick up your flaws more easily, which brings me to my next point. When a guitar player is rocking out on stage, it might be fine that like he or she is squeaking their strings and tapping their foot. It's totally fine because it's a performance, but when they're recording on the mic, those are unwanted sounds. The tapping of the foot, the squeaking of the strings, all that's going to be unwanted in a recording. So the guitar player has to be more conscious of how they approach their recording. That would be like guitar production, I guess. <laughs> so same goes with us. We need to keep in mind our funny sounds that we make. It might be as simple as, oh crap, I didn't realize that my earrings are kind of hitting against the plastic of the headphone string. You gotta be aware of things like that. If you're holding a piece of paper with your lyrics, we might hear the paper rustles. One thing I need to be aware of is when I have my headphones on, sometimes I can like be rocking back and forth and the wire will like hit against either my chair or this shelf. A typical huge offender is the saliva in the mouth. During a take, we hear that <laughs> ugly sound. Nobody, nobody wants to hear that. So be aware of your funny mouth sounds when you're playing back your take. If you hear it, cut it again. Don't tap your foot. Don't bang into things. If you are really rocking out and you accidentally go like this and you hit that, did you hear that? Like I, I accidentally hit the pop filter and it made a big boom sound. Something funny I recently realized is I love those La Croix like soda waters. And when I cracked one open and sat it right here, I realized there's like this after fizz that I was hearing. And I was like, oh my God, it's getting into the mic. So I'm not allowed to drink soda water while recording. <laughs> I definitely always encourage people to move a little with the music. It is one of my techniques to really get into it. But try to become like a reverse bobblehead where your head kind of stays in one place and your body can move. Like, can you isolate your head and keep it in the right place with the mic? So we're going to jump into the performance part of vocal production and make sure you download the PDF, print that out, and use that as your cheat sheet when you're about to record your song. I'm going to go over all that stuff and also elaborate on it a little bit more. But once you have all this soaked in, just use that sheet as a quick reference guide. Okay, here are some tips for nailing your performance. Uh, one thing I like to do a lot is kind of get like a mental reset throughout the recording as well as a physical reset. And I do that by simply like taking a step back, taking a deep breath and yawning and stretching my face as many ways as I can. If you don't already know this, you have two palettes on the roof of your mouth. You have your hard palate, which you could feel is towards the front of your mouth and then it gets softer towards the back. That's your soft palate, and you can move it. When you yawn, you feel it go up. 
I always love a nice soft palate stretch before I sing. I've been told that this facial stretching also elicits a relaxation response in the nervous system, so that will help you just feel reset and ready to go if you're getting a little fatigued in the booth. There's a tip. Everything's always better with an engaged core. Engage your core for a more accurate, intentional performance. One thing that's helped me a lot, because I do tend to be a flat singer. If I'm going to be pitchy, it's going to be flat. So one thing that's kind of funny that helps me is when I'm singing along and I approach that high note, I raise my eyebrows when I hit that note. <laughs> so it just helps me reach it for some reason. Also, if I have my core engaged, I might squeeze a little tighter in the core when I'm going for that higher note. It's probably more mental than anything, um, but if it works, it works. Try it out. There is something to be said about when we have headphones on, we can't hear ourselves perfectly. It's actually quite common for even like the best singers to be more pitchy when they have headphones on than when they don't. So any little tricks that work for you to help you sing more in pitch during your takes is great. Use it. One thing that I use is my hands. I use my hands a lot. Have you noticed? Maybe Christina Aguilera does it too, you know, when she like follows her riffs with her hand. Um, but yeah, sometimes I follow the melody up and down with my hand and it kind of just keeps me on task, you know? Okay, so when you press play, you're not starting immediately right on it, right? You're usually starting one to two bars before. That one to two bars before is called pre-roll. So during the pre-roll, when you hit start, you hear the music so you have the sense of the key. During that empty space, treat that like your warm-up and just sing the first word that you're about to sing. So if you're about to sing a part that's like, are we there yet? During my pre-roll two bars, I'll be like, ah, uh, ah, uh, are we there yet? And I'll be ready for that take. What I have on our performance list next is to move with the music, get out of your head and into your body and into the way your emotions feel in the body. And lastly, for the nailing the performance part of this lesson is I hate to give you more work to do, but by the time you sing verse two, you might find that you're a little bit warmer and you're kind of more into the song. You've shaken off all the nerves and you're just kind of singing better by verse two. You might decide it's a good idea to actually go back and re-record verse one. Okay, this is the sauciest part of the week. I'm gonna give you my styling tips. This is just gonna feel like a very random list of things you can keep in mind and try on for size when you're recording your song. Tip number one is to sing words the way they sound. So you wanna sing the emotion that the word itself carries. For example, if you're singing a song about how you're feeling, can you emphasize the word feeling in a way where you're feeling it? You could sing it really boring, like, because I feel it. Or you could sing, because I feel it. And it just has more emotion to it. So just embody those words and sing how the words feel. Think about how you speak when you're feeling a certain thing. Like if you're angry, how are you portraying that in the tone of your voice? Translate things like that to your singing. Tip number two is if you're fully committed, it will sound great. No matter how goofy or over the top, if you're 100%, it will sound awesome. If you're 80%, it might sound awkward. I used to feel a little embarrassed if I gave a certain emotion in a session and it you could hear it. I didn't sound committed and it was just kind of blah. Why do you think that Doja Cat and Nicki Minaj kill it? It's because they are silly. They're goofy AF, but they own it so, so well and they wear it so well and it comes through on the mic. Like they don't really give a F and they are just going to kill it. So if you're going to be silly, be 100% silly. Don't be 80%. You'll be awkward. <laughs> okay. Play around with the use of vibrato and non-use of vibrato. Sometimes it works really, really cool to just hold a note. Vibrato tends to be something that is just very natural to us. Each individual human has a slightly different rate in the vibration of their vibrato. I mean, some people tend to like kind of not even really use vibrato. Some people use it constantly. I personally don't know how to control the rate of my vibration. It sounds kind of like the same oscillating rate every time I sing it, but I can control whether it's there or not. So sometimes, you know, there's a difference between because I feel and because I feel. You hear the difference. Depending on where you are in the song, it will sound cool if you take it away sometimes or if you 
overemphasize it sometimes. It's all going to depend on the song and depend on you and your individual voice. But just play with it and decide, like, does it sound cool without it? This is a big one. A lot of top 40 radio songs, you will notice the vocal performance being heavily choppy sometimes. That means, like, they're putting a lot of separation between the words. They're really making each word super short. Keep in mind when you want to use very, very choppy or very legato and where all the words are sounding like they're connected. Let me think of an example. I'm just coming up with these lines on the top of my head. So like, I'm going out tonight. I I find when I sing choppy, I kind of do this with my hand. It kind of helps me stay choppier. I don't know. Just all these mental tricks really help me. I'm going out tonight versus I'm going out tonight. Having a good mix of that from section to section, maybe you have a choppy section and then you follow it with a legato section, that'll give your song some rhythmic dynamics. One of my mantras in the recording booth is make it sound easy. An example I give is trying to cover a Beyonce song. Like, have you ever tried to cover a Beyonce song? It's really, really hard. Her songs are really hard to sing, but you wouldn't know it because she makes it sound effortless. So when a part is hard, how can you make it sound effortless? If you need to just record like five words only and nail those five words before moving on to the next five words, do what you got to do. Relax your shoulders, relax your face, give yourself this like nonchalant energy and take it as many times as you need to nail it. That effortlessness, that make it sound easiness kind of relates to my next point, which is singing with swag. Try to sound like you're a cool person on the mic. It's really this like my arms are melting off of my body. My face is is melting off of my bones and I'm just like I don't give a f- mm. I swear a lot in real life but I don't want to swear on camera yeah it's just this IDGAF feeling where you're just like I'm so bored and I'm just too cool to be here try to incorporate this like it's really easy for me I'm just chilling this is no sweat this is just this attitude of swag and it sounds really cool all right this part's fun Try to get to know your personal different tones of voice. Over time, I've been hired to sing so many different styles of music that I've realized I have a ton of different tones. Can you sing the same line powerfully and belted? Or can you sing it kind of light and airy? Some people call that falsetto. Can you sing it in your mixed voice? Can you sing like somewhere in between powerful and soft? Can you experiment with like different mouth shapes like within your mouth itself with that soft palette like can you try to shape your mouth differently try this out pick a line any line in your song and sing it five different ways. On the same notes, I'm not talking about singing it an octave higher or lower. How can you keep it on the same notes, but change the quality of the tone of your voice? So a great way to practice this is to listen to many different artists on Spotify and try to sing along, see how closely you can match their tone. Mastering different tones is going to open a lot of doors for you. We're going to talk more about vocal arrangement in week three, but one thing I love to do is sing a slightly different tone on my background doubles of the lead. So maybe my lead is like a very round, powerful sound, but on my backgrounds, I might do a more airy sound and that'll give it a lot more depth and texture. Adding extra air on your voice is always a really cool thing to do in studio. A friend of mine and I were talking about how we kind of do this thing where on the final word of a phrase, we'll be done singing the word, but we'll still let out a little extra follow through breath. So it sounds like, take me there. It just like, ah. It just has this very beautiful release. So that's one of my little techniques when I want to throw a little extra sauce on there. You may have heard this one before because it works. Smiling while singing really brightens up the part. You can totally hear the difference when someone's not singing with a smile and when they are singing with a smile. I didn't even really change my tone there, but you can hear how it just starts to brighten. I use this a lot and I even sometimes smile on like darker, sadder lyrics. It sounds awesome even if it doesn't make sense to be smiling on a certain line. Try it out anyway. We talked about vibrato a little bit already, but uh, one thing I love to do is to hold a longer held out note with no vibrato and save the vibrato for the very last moment. It's just like a little bit at the end is just so nice. This is another one that sounds weird on paper, but it sounds cool on the track. If you have a long held out word that ends with a consonant, Maybe give a little extra attention to the final consonant on the word time, for example. Time versus time. It just like gives it a little something extra. So that is some Camara seasoning salt for style on the mic. Try some of those techniques out. And now we're going to get a little bit more technical with it. How to get the best comp take. Okay, here's everything I want you to keep in mind to set yourself up to get the best comp take. 
Um, what is a comp take? When you're really vocal producing your song, you're not just going to sing it one time through and hope that one was the one. You're going to sing maybe a few lines at a time and you're going to sing them many times and then you're going to comp, which means you're going to go listen back a little bit at a time and pick the best words and slice them together to make one beautiful compilation track of pieces of multiple takes. I'm just going to give you a list of things to keep in mind and next week when we get into editing, I'll show you actually what it looks like and how to do it properly. So here's my process. I'm never recording more than like two to four lines in a take. I'm just focused on nailing these two to four lines and that is it. And I will sing them maybe like three to five times before I start looking to comp it. And when I comp it, I'm basically going to be listening to three or four words at a time, like, you know, just a small section. And then I'll listen to you. take one, take two, take three over and over till I know which one was the best. And then I'll pop that up to the top where my comp track is and then I'll move on to the next set of couple words and pick that best section pop it up to the top once you've done that entire section you want to zoom in on where those cuts are placed and you always want to do a crossfade or you're going to hear a big like click or pop sound that is called a bad edit or a non-edit now you might listen to your new comp take and decide I still didn't nail like the fourth word of this line. So what you want to do next is called punching in. So you're really just focusing on nailing that one word or couple words, but you must follow through, meaning you need to sing a couple words before and a couple words after, because if you just go in and just wait and then just sing the one word, it's not going to comp naturally. It's going to sound really robotic when that one word just pops in, right? So you always want to sing a little bit before and a little bit after. That rule also goes with singing your four lines that you're just going to focus on right now. If the song is written in a way where at the end of those four lines, there's like a nice space, then you're fine. But if that line continues into the next line, sing like the first couple words of the next line just so that you have that follow through so that when you comp it together it will sound really natural. I mean recording is a really a magical thing and so there is nothing wrong with doing a couple magic tricks. If you wrote a line that's like super duper long and it's kind of just like impossible to take a breath anywhere but you can't exactly sing the whole line all the way through without like gassing out at the end it's fine to punch in in the middle of that line and no one will know because you have a perfectly clean edit. I can't emphasize the follow through enough even if you forget the next lyric that's coming. I do this a lot where I literally am so focused on my first four lines that I don't even remember what the next line is. But if I arrive at the end of the phrase and I don't remember what the next word is, I'll just like blurt out some jargon just so that the last word of the phrase I am focused on is like the correct length, you know? So that's really it when it comes to preparing for the comp take. We will go into the technicals of it next week and I'll show you the best practices for how to fade everything and make everything sound like a perfectly continuous take. This this week your homework is easy. All you have to do this week is find an instrumental if you don't have one already or choose a cover song that you want to do and get an instrumental together for that. If you're going to write an original song, write it this week and next week we're going to start recording. I'll see you there.